This is an Nexus Special, Episode 52, WWDC 2017, on Monday, June 5th, 2017. And now, thanks, Furious Potato, this episode of the Nexus Special is hosted by Brandon Johnson and Ryan Rampersad. Oh, heck, this is one big keynote, don't you think? Uh, this was a pretty big keynote, yes. What's yeah. funny about this keynote is that it didn't start with something big. It had to take a while to build up. Yeah, so admittedly, I was not there for most of the build up. So when, when I when I uh, showed up to, to the live stream, uh, I I saw a lot of stuff that just kind of hit me in the face. Like, whoa, 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 how did we get here? But looking at the looking at the progression of this uh, that we've got in the show notes, it looks like you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, let's start up with TVOS. Well, there's literally one thing to say about TVOS. You know, you might have been thinking that we were going to get a hardware rev or, you know, maybe we were going to get some new glorious features. No, Amazon Prime Video is coming later this year. The thing they talked about That's doesn't pretty... even happen until later this year. Oh, <sighs> no. Well, I, I don't know. As a, as a Prime subscriber, I'm still pretty excited about being able to use Amazon Prime Video on my hypothetical I- apple tv that i don't have i actually uh, have an apple tv that's too old to get these updates of course um but yeah right because that's that's the name of the game but yep. um you know that's amazon Prime video is the one thing that i still go to uh to my tv for to use my tv's built-in hashtag smart tv dot oh. feature um yeah so so uh it, it's not great uh, we always joke that whenever you have whenever you try to launch uh an app on that uh, quote unquote smart TV uh, kind of user interface. We always joke that it has to spin up a couple instances of uh, the JVM. And then there's like an electron app running on the JVM. No. And that's, that's, that's what you see. That's how prime video loads. It's not just prime video. I should, I should say and it's then, prime video, Netflix, Hulu, whatever, whatever you try to watch on the uh, smart TV. And then the like, electron app uh, uses Nashhorn inside of the JVM to run a virtual node. You betcha. Oh my gosh, that's terrible to think about. Yep, terrible to think about, but probably not too uh, not too off base. So we did. <laughs> I did at one point look at the API for the TV, and it, it turns out that everything's just a a HTML5 web app. Figures, uh, but of course, I think it's running in a Tomcat container. So I believe the TV is running Tomcat. What it could be? What kind on. of disaster is this TV? Uh, well, it runs U- uh, Yahoo's smart TV software or Yahoo's connected TV software. Uh, so that should give you the indication, yes. <laughs> all the indication you need yes. as to what kind of awful it is. Yep, yep. But uh, suffice it to say, I would be very excited to not have that in my life uh, and just use the TV as a gosh darn TV. Uh, so this Apple TV uh, update might actually entice me to upgrade. Well, we'll see, you know. Surely will. You know, maybe at one of those uh, fall events, maybe a little tease some additional TVOS stuff and it just Very wasn't true. ready to talk about yet. That's true. That is kind of the name of the game with keynotes like this. Yeah. Well, speaking of things that are ready, uh, WatchOS 4 uh, made an appearance. And unlike 2 to 3, 4 is not as exciting. Um, some minor new features. Just sort of kind of minor. So new watch faces. Um, they they are leveraging their somehow still ongoing relationship with Pixar to have some cool watch faces with characters. <laughs> um, they're also in, uh, introducing a Siri powered watch face that will use some kind of machine learning to surface reminders, traffic notices, meetings, news, and other things that you might like. Yeah, this is definitely a subtle hint at uh, at other kind of machine learning stuff that let's discuss later in the keynote. Yep. Um, but it sounds actually rather rather useful. Um, we'll, ha- we'll we'll remain to see how how smart it actually is and what data it has access to and what it can surface. Yeah, um, I would be interesting to know how much it requires the network. Exactly. Exactly. I yeah. A, a lot of the a lot of the name of that game right is is to use. Uh, it is to get that from some sort of external source that knows right. more about your information than you do. Yep. But that doesn't necessarily feel like it would be a very Apple-y approach. And so, especially on the watch, it, there's like no computing power there. So exactly. it, it could use more of the phone to do it. And then it just ships it over from the phone to the watch. Yeah. But even then, like you're absolutely right. Like even, even in that case, uh, there's, 
network traffic in the sense of yep. using your phone essentially as the server, using sure. your phone as the, as the source of truth. And that still needs to go over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Um, it's really interesting if you've ever um, taken a look at what sort of requests go over the wire there. It's it's pretty uh, pretty intricate. Um, mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you're right there that that's probably going to be pretty battery intensive on the watch at least, probably on the watch on the phone, but certainly the watch. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, some additional fitness features of some sort. Mm -hmm. I have really no idea what those mean. Um, some kind of new workout app, new integrations with gym equipment. Probably not that exciting. Um, and then finally, uh, better interrupt with other devices via Bluetooth. And they used a glucose monitor ex as example. Uh, you might recall rumors prior to this event about Apple integrating in a future version of the Apple Watch a glucose monitor. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is a uh, precursor to that, or maybe those rumors were completely wrong. And this is really what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, either way, like the, the fitness and kind of health uh, kind of promise of the watch is something that's still, uh, as of yet remained rather untapped. So to see that they're, they're generating these relationships with places that make that kind of hardware is is definitely intriguing. So yeah. there was a time a while back when you could, uh, for example, connect an iPod to like a treadmill to certain like Nike Plus treadmills back when Nike Plus was Apple's fitness offering more mm -hmm. or less. Yep. And it would like convert your it would it would track and like shunt that data to your to your phone as like or oh my god this is pre phone what am I talking about Oof. like uh, uh, to your iPod right as as Nike Plus data which is neat but. Um, but I guess like the, the this is kind of a an extension of those relationships. I mean, not necessarily those relationships uh, as they were, but like that that's definitely something that Apple's thinking about, and that's something that's cool to see extending into other things that are kind of a little bit more specific. Uh, one thing about this that I don't think was mentioned, but I, I remember hearing. I think Apple bought Bedit, which is this uh, sleep tracking uh, device that you can kind of like attach to a bed, and it will. Uh, it, it's a little bit higher tech version of the, that like wearable or mm -hmm. that, that app that would, that basically you put next to your face. Um, and then, uh, and then it will track your sleep based on how you like how much, uh, displacement it senses right with the accelerometer, mm -hmm. um, what kind of movement it senses and stuff like that. Uh, so that like Apple's investment in that space is really something that's, uh, well documented, but, uh, it's interesting to see how that how that's being seen as like uh, for the most part related to the watch and not to the phone, which is which is pretty great as, as a watch owner at least. As mm -hmm. a watch owner, it's pretty great. So you, you do you have a first gen watch or a second gen watch? I do have a first gen watch, so most of these things won't apply to me. But uh, so, so it goes. Yeah. Uh, so it goes. Uh, I I don't remember. I actually don't remember whether this only applies to series two or does this go to all watches? Yeah. I don't, I don't know watches. if they made a big point of telling me about if it did or not. Yeah. I'm betting, I'm betting that it's going to be, uh, that some features are going to be restricted to series two watches, yeah. which just, which just makes sense. Right? right. Like I get it. This watch is two years old now. Yeah. I understand. It doesn't make me happy, but I understand. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of making you happy, uh, what about macOS? Doesn't macOS make you happy? Uh, I guess so. Yeah. It, it did at one point. I guess so. Well. <laughs> oh, there is there is one thing I'd like to talk about this related to Safari immediately, if okay. that's cool. Well, we have to talk uh, about the name first. Oh, I didn't hear about the name. Okay. Well, so what's the name of the current version of OS X? I mean, macOS. Uh, Sierra. Okay. Now, in the pattern that Apple likes to do, so you got to... You've got a leopard, and then you have a snow what? Snow, uh, leopard. snow leopard. Then you have um, a lion, and then you have a what? Uh, mountain lion. Okay, so then you have a Sierra, and then you have a what? Uh, burnt Sienna. No, no, you have a high <laughs> Sierra. Oh, no. Yeah. Which gave, which gave Craig Federighi a chance to make his favorite uh, cannabis joke. Yeah, I'm sure it did. I'm sure that's literally what he did. Um, right. I, I, um... <laughs> This is not the name that I'm going to laugh at heavily during this episode. However, mm -hmm. this name amused me because, well, it's it's just like, wow, just, you just couldn't stay away from the paired up names. Um, right. I guess I, I guess I failed. Well, they sort of did. 
Yosemite and El Cap, you know, it's pretty close. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. I always, yeah. That one's distinct enough so that you don't fall for it. Right. But man, they, they were so close. Right, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so tell me about Safari, because this Safari is wonderful. So one of my favorite things that uh, didn't really get a ton of fanfare with Safari 11, but I am super psyched about nonetheless, is the inclusion of WebRTC. Woo-hoo! So le- legendarily, or, or, or um, perhaps uh, infamously, Safari has been lagging behind every other browser, and WebKit has been lagging behind every other engine uh, in WebRTC support. Uh, WebRTC- and other things, don't let them fool you. Uh, well, WebRTC is the only one that makes me perpetually sad every day. Uh, <laughs> that that and uh, okay, maybe some other things. Uh, WebKit is bay. Don't forget. Uh, but uh, the, the thing that Web, WebRTC will get you is uh, real real time uh, video conferencing or audio recording, really underlying access to um, media devices. So any sort of camera or microphone that's attached to your computer or phone. Uh, or in the case of the phone, of course, any 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 hardware that is part of the phone that allows you to to um, to access that and work that into a web experience. So, in in my mind, like WebRTC is I like I don't care so much for for the conferencing parts of it, right? Oh mm-hmm. well, you know, a lot of people use it for like web based uh, telepresence stuff, things yeah, like that, video but chat, I, yeah. Yeah, but the amount of stuff you can just do if you with the get user media APIs or get yep. get media devices APIs and a canvas or mm-hmm. some sort of thing that's rendered on top of this this view from the from the camera or the or something you can do to transform the audio that people are getting like that is unreal. That is what I think the future of like web experiences or interactive web stuff is is going to be all about, and I'm hoping. Uh, or I'm really glad to see that that Safari has kind of joined the second decade of the 21st century in that regard, because it was really going to hurt me in a couple couple months if I couldn't start doing that uh, stuff cross platform. Well, so what 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 I think is sad about this Safari release, and and sure mm-hmm. it might be faster and it might be nice and great, and sure WebRTC stuff is in there, um, and we can talk about some of the the new intelligent tracking prevention tech they added to in a minute. Yeah, but my um, impression of what they added feature wise for the technical part is that without service workers, we have to wait another year for progressive web apps to be real. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get it. I, t- I totally I totally see the, the value in service workers. But man's server side rendered rendered apps is where it's at. <laughs> kidding. Um, <laughs> kidding. Not kidding. Kidding. Um no, I, I totally, I, I totally get that. Service workers are admittedly a thing that I haven't worked with super extensively, but I don't, I don't live in that space in the same way. I don't and, live in that. And the reason you can't work with them extensively is because you can't work with them in 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 half of the world's browsers. Oops. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Um. Yeah, you're mm-hmm. right. <laughs> so I, I keep trying to pitch them to people, but everybody keeps realizing, oh well, um, only like twenty percent of our users can actually use them because iOS is still two years too late uh-huh oops well uh speaking of uh good stuff though in safari they added intelligent tracking prevention which is basically they're going to somehow randomize slash anonymize um tracking ids somehow uh-huh. um in safari so i don't know nice. i don't know if that means like cookies will be scrambled somehow or your user agent will be occasionally different somehow. They didn't explain in detail what that meant, but they're going to do that. Yeah, that's probably that's probably in part because anything that they'd explain <laughs> uh, how to do it would immediately cause unscrupulous folks to try to find a way around it or just still fingerprint people. And I think that's still going to happen. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess they have to do their due, due diligence in that regard uh, to just like be a little bit opaque in the hopes that it won't take forever to or in the hopes it'll take folks a little bit longer to bypass it so they say they are using machine learning to identify trackers and segregate cross-site scripting data put it away now put away now so your privacy your browsing history is your own he didn't say really why right how or i I don't know Mm, yeah personally this seems like a weird place to mention machine learning because i don't 
I mean, I can see how machine learning would be helpful, but it, it seems like there are other other ways to solve that problem uh, that were probably a little bit more straightforward. Yeah, and yeah. like what people would would have been asking for, right? Or, or what the community uh, who's knowledgeable about these things would probably prefer to do. But who knows? Okay, so it's it's some kind of it's some kind of heuristic thing, kind of basically. So there's yeah, there's a, a right up here on the WebKit uh, blog, and um, I'm not going to read it right now. So you should go read that, dear listener. Let's talk about photos. Surely, surely. Uh, updated photos app. Great. That's about all I know about it. Yep. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but now we're getting to the feet of it, though. Yes. Uh, APFS, uh, Apple's file system that couldn't be called AFS because that's another thing oh. that's much more obscure. Huh. Uh, but APFS, App Pull FS, uh, it's it's going to be it's going to replace HFS, uh, HFS Plus, which is uh, long overdue for anyone who's listened to or read or consumed any of the content of Mr. John Syracuse. You will know that uh, that that is a thing that many people have been asking for for a very 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 long time. Uh, I've been, uh, of course, using APFS by, uh, on my, uh, on my, uh, iOS devices, uh, as probably you have too, uh, for a couple months now, right? They rolled that out with iOS 10.2, I want to say. Some, right? some version number. Yeah. Yeah. One of them. Yeah. Um, and that feels pretty solid. I don't, uh, you know, admittedly that was around the same time as I got a new phone. So who knows whether I can attribute that to the file system or the fact that I have entirely new hardware, it's probably the latter. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm excited because I've seen some particular situations over the past month where, uh, HFS plus has really not been a pal, uh, some drives that have died in really strange ways. Uh, some, uh, some weird file descriptor issues among other things. Uh, and it just kind of makes me long for whatever the next thing is. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next thing has been ZFS for a long time. Yep. Uh, but whatever. Uh, I'll take APFS in its stead. Well, so it, as, as far as ZFS, I mean, ZFS isn't dead in the sense that all your yeah. other drives can be that way. For um, sure. And then and they, that, will, and they are. <laughs> <laughs> and then they can have a chance at being cross-platform. Because how for many sure. years will it take for, I don't know, Ubuntu to get a uh, driver to actually read APFS. Oh, I don't know, ten years, right? Um, so they they demoed on stage, and I don't, I couldn't find any more details. But they they had a bunch of additional things that um, Finder can do now because uh-huh. of APFS being you know alive, and it and it's, sure. and it's all just integrated and it's powered by APFS, and that's how it works. That's awesome. So, for example, when you copy a file from one place to another place, it doesn't take additional space. It's just a kind of virtual copy until you change it somewhere. Nice. So and that makes perfect sense because that's how APFS works. Absolutely, absolutely. That just seems like the way to do it. Yeah. Um, and that's actually really important with photos because that's making copies all over the place constantly. For real. Um. So let's talk about um some other stuff. Um, they introduced Metal Two and Metal for VR. So they're they're um enhancing their Metal platform, which is sort of their their um, Vulcan or their. Uh, you know, it's their fancy internal graphics. Yeah, low-level graphics f- f- framework, I'd refer to it as, perhaps. Yeah, and they also made one that's specifically designed for VR work, which is uh, pretty interesting, considering that um, they don't have any computers that can support VR. Uh, mm. Not yet. Mm. Not yet. So, uh, another thing, did, did you catch uh, the external graphics? I did. I uh, did. Yeah, that's that's something else. You can buy an external enclosure for a graphics card and attach it to a MacBook Pro, uh, <laughs> which uh, they're actually selling a developer kit for that uh, on the on the developer portal right now. So, and I thought about it, but then I realized I don't have a MacBook Pro that would support it. <laughs> right, exactly. Now, even worse is how much do you suppose that external enclosure will cost in retail after this? Right. So right right now it'll run it'll run you six fifty, I think. Yeah. With, including a. Uh, including a graphics card to fill that slot, but yeah, that's uh, not terrible yeah. then. So what? So maybe it's three hundred dollars, and the graphics card was three hundred dollars. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So that's okay. So uh, hi Sierra, uh, beta program coming soon. So probably in a couple of weeks, probably right after WWGC. Maybe I don't know. Right. Ships in the fall. Imagine that. Yeah. The so, but the real question about this is: Are either of us going to run it? on any of our machines well um my macbook air has not been updated since probably 
Yosemite. I don't even think it has El Capitan on it, to be honest. Oh, man. So now's the time. <laughs> I don't use the MacBook Air anymore. Uh, it just sits on a shelf in a bag. It's off. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. My computer from work, though, I will definitely upgrade it as soon as I can. So probably whatever number this thing. What number is this? Is this 1013? 1013. Okay, so 1013.1, I will upgrade and it'll be fine. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm not going to... So my my only Mac that is eligible for this is my work Mac, which um, is too crucial for me to run uh, alpha software oh, on. Oh, absolutely. So I there's no way I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to set that up. I'm probably going to download some of the pre-release beta tool chains, but like so for Xcode yeah. uh, and for iOS, but there's no way of running a, a pre-release operating system on that thing. And to be honest, uh, I think even the 1013 or what? 1014? What? Yeah. Yeah. 1013. Even, even 1013.0 is too alpha E for me. I need 1013.1 to be safe. I get you. I'd probably be okay with 1013.0, but, uh, but that's just because I... I like to live on the edge with my computers, <laughs> despite despite what I just said. Um, I just don't like to actively feel like I'm being reckless. Yeah. If, if Apple says if Apple says it's it's ready for release, it's ready for release in my eyes. Yeah. But if it, Apple says it's pre-release, then. But even though you're absolutely right, the way to do it is to wait for dot one. Yeah. That said, all of this kind of has me thinking maybe I should get a Mac Mini. No, right. no, because the Mac Mini didn't get any updates. Hey, you want to talk about some updates? Let's talk about some updates. Hey, new Macs, by the way. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, not that we're interested in any new Macs, though, because they're iMacs. New displays. Oh, no. New 5K iMacs in the smaller and the bigger sizes. New, faster Cabby Lake processors. Processor yep. in the Cabby Lake flavor only took more than a year too long. I don't know what took so long. Right. Um, additional graphics options. Uh, they're using Radeon Pro 500 series, goodish, I guess. Um, For sure. I don't really know too much about the new regular iMacs that were introduced here. Um, you know, they're just iMacs. Yep, uh, definitely a hardware upgrade, an internal hardware upgrade. But uh, um, one cool exact, thing yeah. is that they will have a new configuration option, up to 64 gigabytes of memory. Hoof. Hoof. Yeah, that's that's right. Yikes. Yeah. That is a lot of memory. That is more memory than I have in my brain, I fear. <laughs> well, very very likely sometimes. Um so there's there's a um so then there's the 5K iMac of course, and then there's also the 4K 21 inch. So right. you know, you you've got 5K and 4K, all of the Ks are covered. Um so that's good. Now, in the laptop lineup, there's also been some updates. Now, not the updates you wanted. So the keyboard wasn't fixed, and the trackpad wasn't made smaller, and the keyboard track bar thing. What is it called? Magic trackpad? Uh, the touch bar. Uh, touch bar. The touch yep. bar wasn't fixed. See, I just don't Apple right. I don't even know the terms. Um, <laughs> touch bar wasn't fixed. No, actually, the only thing that was actually changed was the processor. Yeah. yeah. So in the MacBook Pro... All of them got a price. So no, I lied. Only one of them got a price update. The 13-inch Pro without Touch Bar has a cheaper price now. Woohoo! Which yeah, I mean that's good. That's good. People, like that should be the the base laptop for most people now. I guess. Yeah, I guess. Quote and, unquote for, for most people. Quote unquote. And and so that, that that's to me that's a shame because um, they made this cool technology, but for some reason they're pricing that one. So that everybody buys it, even though it's not the one with the tech they wanted everybody to have. Right, right. Which begs the question: What was their what was their actual motive for the Touch Bar, and <laughs> right. who did they think would use it or care about it? Yeah, which um, nobody knows. So they all have Cabby Lake now, which is great. Um, I think there are some additional SKUs for um, graphics on the on the 15 inch. I think. Uh huh. Um, and weirdest thing, the MacBook Air. Didn't get an update of any kind except a, a few hundred megahertz speed bump. So it's not even, it doesn't even have an upgraded processor. No, it's still, it fifth, just... still fifth gen Broadwell apparently, which is bizarre. That <sighs> is bizarre. Uh, it's just a few hundred megahertz faster. Doesn't Jeez. have to make sense. It just has to exist because it's the best That's... selling Mac in the world, right? 
Hi. Uh, mm. Yeah, it is. Now, speaking of best selling, I can I interest you in a Mac that starts at five thousand dollars, but that isn't uh-huh. a Mac Pro? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. No. Oh maybe? well, Apple oh, no. Apple would like to interest you in an iMac Pro. It is twenty seven inches. It has Xeon cores. The configurations will be 10, 12, and 18. Base 32 gigabyte model, DDR4 ECC, up to 128 gigabytes. Base of one terabyte solid state, two and four terabytes are optional. Uh, Vega Pro graphics, and it is coming later this year in December, and the base price starts at only a cheap and reasonable $5,000. Yeah, that's, that's, that's something else. It is something else, and what's hilarious about this is on screen they showed, uh, you know, they're trying to compare this to, um, you know, a workstation Dell. You know, what's funny about that is they were saying, well, you know, the average workstation Dell could cost you seven thousand dollars. We're Apple; we can make it cheaper. But what's Uh, funny though is that it's not true because you can get a a Xeon Dell for way cheaper than seven thousand dollars. And and sure, you know, it's not going to be as beautiful looking. But you can definitely do it. Very, very true. Very, um, very true. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> yeah, the so Apple the, tax, you know. It's it's how it goes. Yeah. I'm, so the here, here's here's a thing that I've been doing that's probably not super healthy, and certainly isn't super healthy to uh, my continued patronage of Apple. Is that uh, so? I upgraded my desktop recently, and uh, I also bought a personal laptop recently. Neither of which were Apple uh, Apple products, which was weird, very weird, very strange, uh, and I don't, I still don't know how I feel about it. Um, but, uh, a lot of that was, uh, was for essentially the, the, the reason of giving myself some separation between the computing I do at work and the computing I do at home. Totally reasonable. Uh, yeah. So like the, the trick is now whenever I'm at home, I have to use a windows computer Ugh. uh, or, uh, or Fedora, which is great. Um, you know, I'm running, but- um, in, in my other window here, I have HTOP running in, um, hyper term running yes. on best for windows. It's not bad. It's really cool. That is, that is pretty great. So I I also have Bash for Windows, not on my desktop, but on my laptop, and uh, yeah, it's it's pr- pretty pretty cool. But yep. I still I still prefer a full Fedora environment if oh, I can swing of it. Of course. Uh, but uh, the thing is, I've been kind of unhealthy unhealthily comparing the prices for my recent desktop update and my recent uh, laptop purchase mm-hmm. to uh, you know like how many of the laptops I bought a month ago could I buy for the price of a MacBook pro that I, I would want that has a similar <laughs> process process processor model number and a similar, similar processor, uh, uh, clock speed anywhere and between two and three. Yeah, yeah. Four. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I mean, I've got an i7 7,000 series. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm a laptop and on the desktop. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, and I think the laptop upgrade or the desktop upgrade all in one, all, uh, all said and done was I think $500, um, which is, uh, which was a little unreal to me because I was I, like, that seems like, uh, for, for a thing that essentially remade this computer, uh, it, it seems like a, that seems like a, a low price, but that's cause I've been buying Macs all my life, I guess. You know, it's it's amazing when you buy your own hardware and you put it together yourself. How cheap it gets! Right, right. When I f- was first building my own computer, it felt like it felt like everything was way more expensive. But no longer now. Yeah, no longer now. So I, I was and, talking to um, some people in my office about yeah. this um, iMac Pro, and some people liked it. Some people were really really disappointed that it's not user serviceable. Um, you know, everything that's in it kind of is in it forever, basically. I guess. And that, mm-hmm. that's kind of been the trend on the laptops, on the iMacs, and everything. And so this doesn't answer the age-old desire of the Mac Pro, which is user-serviceable, user-upgradable, for the professional, right. who knows what they're doing. Now, I think I think that's kind of what the whole points have always been. But even if they make a Mac Pro for next year or 2019, um, it, it'll probably be less than $5,000. Right. But... You know the the screen is basically a thousand dollars, so it'll be four thousand dollars. Uh huh. So will that be user serviceable, upgradable? Maybe, but but what we really want from Apple is a two thousand ish dollar machine that's user serviceable and upgradable. Right. I don't need Xeon support. 
I just need, you know, i7 support or maybe, I guess, enthusiast line support. Exactly. Some Something that'll fit some, whatever the current version of the LGA socket is. Right. So I, I don't need Xeon. I just need something better than a Mac Mini, but that I can right. s- stick some more memory into or a new solid state drive into. For sure. Yeah, we're, sure. we're never going to get that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping, but I'm with you. Anyhow, before we get any more sad about this, let's move over to iOS. What do you say? Yeah, iOS is very exciting. Truly, truly. Uh, so as, as a heavy iOS user, iOS and Apple Watch uh, user, uh, particularly I, I also use Handoff between two of my iOS devices. Um, this was a really exciting release. Um, because a lot of, a lot of what it dealt with was, uh, these kind of syncing pains Mm -hmm. that we've, that we've all kind of had since the introduction of stuff like handoff and, uh, and iCloud tabs and iCloud really in general, uh, as we know it today. So, uh, they've mentioned kind of offhand that they're, uh, going to, uh, in iOS 11, improve, uh, syncing of, uh, iMessages, which is great. Um, hopefully they'll, along with that comes, uh, an, uh, a renewed commitment to uh, keeping iMessage kind of the the standard for end to end encrypted messaging. Uh, now, of course, we know that there's some uh, there have been some pretty uh, high profile cases where that's been kind of uh, circumvented through particular scenarios. But um, nonetheless, uh, that's iMessage is still probably other than WhatsApp the most popular messaging platform that implements this, and it's it's important that they keep that in place. Uh, another thing that I thought was interesting was Apple Pay for peer-to-peer payments. Yeah, this now, is pretty most, cool. Most of the things that uh, that I pay people for, I pay people with Square Cash. Mm-hmm. So it's that um, that green app that you can use to send people to uh, send money to somebody's "quote unquote" cash tag, which I think is just uh, it's total. You like know, it's Jack the, Dorsey. It's, yeah, it's, it's their it's Twitter handle. Dorsey. I mean, it's it's what do you what did you expect? Yep, uh, mine actually does not match my Twitter handle. Hilarious. You did it wrong. It could. I did it wrong. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know if I'm going to change. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, of course I will. Of course I'm going to change it. But I don't know if I will, though, because um, the thing that Square Cash has that Apple Pay, I don't know, does is that uh, Apple Pay doesn't support my debit card. Mm. <laughs> Whereas Square Cash will gladly just put something, uh, will gladly shunt something over to your debit card. Um, I don't know if Apple Pay will will support that in the same way. So, and I don't really want um, uh, people sending me money to my credit card. That feels weird. Yeah. Um, I, I I don't know if I want that. So the way that that actually gets uh, gets implemented is uh, is going to be interesting to me. But simultaneously, too, um, Apple Pay is something that so many people will just get by default, and that's really what the power of a lot of these Apple uh, features that Apple announced yep. are. Is that pe- like from the get go people are just going to have this as their opportunity. So they won't need to use something like square cash uh, that otherwise was used by enthusiasts and power users. And yeah, I think, I think that's, that's thing. true to some degree. So again, we were discussing this at the office and yeah. uh, I said, well, what happens? And this will come up again later. Cause it's kind of mm-hmm. a theme here. What happens if you have a non iOS device that you need to send something to? Yep. So Apple pay doesn't exist on Android. So now what do we do? Absolutely. Right. So I think, I think that's something that Square Cash, Square Cash will still fit that realm, I guess. Exactly. And and the other thing that we'll talk about later also will still fit that realm of sure. what do we do if Apple isn't the only thing we have to deal with? Yep. Yeah. So we also have additional integrations with Siri Kit. So apps can make proactive suggestions through Siri, which is kind of cool, I guess. Yeah. Um, They have to make sure it doesn't get spammy, though. Right, right. That's going to be that's going to be the balance. I think there're going to be a lot of apps that don't that don't pull this off, but I think it'll still be pretty pretty neat for the ones that do. Um and as an assistive feature, you can actually have Siri look at your screen and help you read words off of it. So if you find a word that you don't know how to read, it can read it for you. It's kind of cool. Oh, look, like um like uh out loud. Yeah. I don't know if I saw this part. Yeah, I I don't know exactly how it works, but um, you know, if you kind of imagine like on, on the Mac, you know, you do the f- three finger press down on a word and it can right. pop up the dictionary definition. Maybe you can do that on the phone in a similar right way. On. That's right neat. on for sure. For sure. I, I don't necessarily know if they're I, so like Apple has always been kind of leading the way when it comes to like um, 
like uh, voice generation, I guess almost right. Mm-hmm. Like they've had Mac and talk since the nineties yes. or even eighties. Yep. Um, so if, even if this is just that and doesn't have any more smarts to it, I think that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So we also have a uh, new file format and this one I didn't really read too much into, but it's moving beyond JPEG. <laughs> Is it just JPEG plus raw? Is, well, that, is that what it is? <laughs> I was, I was going to joke that it's just raw. Um, oh, man, that too. Um, I don't know what it is. Um, they, they, some people were talking about how they um, are pushing a new HVAC format, yeah. even though everybody else agreed to use the new open VP29 standard or something. I don't right. know. Um, so it's great for everybody who has iOS and macOS devices, but bad for everybody else so that's cool um right if it's a new file format how does that work when you upload it to something for example like twitter or instagram i think under the hood it's got to just be a shell script running uh <laughs> great right R- running image magic uh, uh, every image you have is literally an executable binary that transcodes itself to whatever you want Mm-hmm. Okay, that's the way to do it. Well, oh, that's right. The way to do so it. you're sending a Docker container as an image. Exactly. Well, you know, uh, uh, if if you commit the Docker container to an image first, that'll help. But yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, now uh, this is a weird one. Lock screen and notifications are merging into a single pull down shade. I think. Yeah, I don't know how to process this either. Um, there, there's this, and then there's another kind of. Uh, another kind of interesting issue or another kind of interesting change that had to do with uh, uh, control center. Yes. So that, that pulling up from, from the bottom of the screen to control things like uh, airplane mode, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth uh, volume and uh, brightness, the brightness um, and volume sliders. They look great. I must say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it looks like an interesting concept and I think, my part of my trepidation about that is also the trepidation uh, that I have towards this merging of lock screen notifications. Yeah, that one's worse. Uh, yeah, it just feels like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't see the design. I don't see the intelligence behind the design yet. I see the groupings, but the groupings don't mean anything to me yet. Yeah. And I, th- I think that's what's kind of concerning. I'm sure I'll get there. I'm sure I'll drink the Kool-Aid eventually. But right now it's yeah. like, yeah. Um, maps will have better airport maps. That's the entire story about maps. Yeah, and also shopping malls too. I heard, and it's like, man, I I've always, as somebody who's always prided myself on being like very good at navigating airports and shopping malls, that, like I don't know why they had to run me out of a job, but I guess whatever, it's up to them. That's okay. Right. Um. So there's a new do not disturb mode while driving, which is pretty cool. So what it does is it silences your notifications. Uh-huh. basically turns off the screen and auto replies i'm driving unless the message that you received has the word urgent in it now here's what's weird is how does this app um cooperate with something for example like maps when you're driving if it turns off the screen you can't navigate anymore that's a very good question, and I have no idea, but I think a lot of people are going to disable this feature pretty quickly. I think it's a great feature. I would love to have an app on my phone that can send a message back sort of in a throttled way to anybody yeah. who sends me a message on Hangouts. I would love that. It would be so useful. But here's For the sure. problem. Hangouts has no APIs. You can't do that. Right. On iOS, it's very easy for Apple to provide an API that they can personally use for iMessage and whatever the texting app is, which is called iMessage. Yep. So, how convenient. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, when I I was talking over this one at work, and a lot of people were concerned, like, oh, so, like, basically, Apple's not going to let you use your phone uh, in in a car now? And uh, somebody else responded, "Uh, no, Apple's just going to not let them let you not let you use your phone in the car, right? It's like, it, it's, this seems very optional and it seems like something that a lot of people are probably going to not, not end up uh, using or not end up activating. Yeah. Maybe, um, maybe it would have to be one of those things. Like if you're docked in the car or yeah. um, like it has to be tied to a, a, a more specific mode. Um, For sure. They, they said that they're using some kind of accelerometer plus Wi-Fi 
proximity to figure out if you're driving or not. And that doesn't yeah. seem foolproof because all the people playing Pokemon Go in their car are going to freak out. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, HomeKit had uh, a little bit of a feature. Multi-room speakers. And this will be very mm. important very soon. Hmm. Very true. Very um, true. Apple Music integration support into apps. So you can somehow tie Apple Music into your app, I guess, if you want. Right. I I don't really know how that would fit, but maybe it will. That, Great. We'll have to see. Yeah. Let, let Apple make an API for you. You figure out how to use it. Um, redesigned App Store app. Less like a store. And what I've read is it's more like a curated magazine. Oh, great. Another one of those. Another um, one of those apps that have boatloads of white space and no content. Yeah, I joked to somebody that it's like Revenge of the Palm Pre is what it feels <laughs> like. Um, yep. I I really, I never discover apps through the App Store anymore. Just give me a list of apps. Yeah. Ugh. I feel I feel like this is not going to help me discover more apps and I don't feel like I'm a person who wants to discover any more apps. Maybe this makes me a ridiculous old person. Well, I think I, I found think, all the apps I need for a little while. <laughs> I think your your problem isn't that you've discovered all the apps that you need. It's that you can't discover the apps you need. So when you go to the App Store and I'm and this is how it is for me on on the Play Store and I'm sure it's similar on the App Store. Yeah. You go there and you hit like top apps and it's literally just a spam page of right in-app purchase apps or junk apps you don't care about or that you already have so like facebook and yep. snapchat and twitter great i already have those what are the other good apps i should have right and there's there's very little movement in that top 100 or even top 1000 and right. being in that list doesn't actually make you good it just yeah you just got lucky somehow exactly Exactly. Right. And I mean, I, I, I say everything I said as somebody who's building mobile applications, which maybe <laughs> is not, not, not very promising. No, for the no, field, no, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, that's fine. Um, so let's talk about some iPad specific features. Now, these are actually really cool. And as we will see in a moment, very relevant. So yes, indeed. iPad has a new dock for apps. Now, this dock is just like the dock on macOS. It grows and contracts. It will show you apps that you have pinned to it and apps that are running currently. It uh -huh. um, sits there at the bottom of the screen when you are on the home screen on Springboard. But then as soon as you enter an app, it goes away. But then you can swipe up from the bottom bezel and see all the apps that you have pinned and what are running. And it's beautiful. Absolutely. Now, what's funny about this dock is that it doesn't look like the dock in macOS currently. It looks like the dock from, like, 10.4. You know, it's kind of right. got this white blob behind it, and it's just a bunch of app icons. It's great, but it looks funny. Now, what what, what a change. I mean, this, this dock, what you can do is um, you can take apps from it and drag them over to the left or right side of the iPad and you can go into, you know, two, dual dual screen mode. I don't know what they call it. Yeah, um, split view. Split, split view. view. Yeah. And and you can and you can just go into that mode just by dragging and dropping apps from the dock. It's it's beautiful, really nice, well done concept. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the main ways I use my iPad nowadays. So it's it's awesome to see that they're continuing to invest in that. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, they have a new multitasking view. So um, when you have I assume it's still the same double press to home button or four finger swipe. Yep. Um, when you do that, you'll see a, I think it's a four by four grid um, on one side of the iPad and you can swipe over there to see it. And then you'll also see um, control center on the other side of um, that, that pop up view. Um, I didn't see that useless thing they introduced a few iterations ago, which was little pictures of all your favorite contacts. Um, so that's great. It's better for app switching. Surely, surely. And then they introduced drag and drop support because when you have things side by side in split view, it makes sense that you can kind of lasso some stuff, take it and then put it into another one. So this is kind of interesting to me because other like that kind of cross application sharing yeah. in the past has mostly been handled by X callback URLs and base 64 encoded stuff or things that you like basically in the URL, you pass the URL as a parameter so that you can, the other app can get something from a URL. Yeah. What and, a, what a nightmare. 
Now this right. looks a lot more feature rich, a lot more content rich. Um, and iOS has some cool stuff. So you can um, kind of tap on a paragraph or a sentence and it will mm-hmm. highlight the thing. And then you can either use the context menu through a force touch, presumably, or a long press, and then just kind of either copy it or you can just long drag it over. Mm-hmm. So it's, it looks really nice. Absolutely. I'm curious to see how much of this gets supported on my three-year-old iPad Air 2. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then finally, um, we have a new Files app, you know, for browsing files. <laughs> hmm. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. This is probably brought closer to parity with uh, with Finder, but uh, not not quite. I wonder not why they didn't that. call it Finder. I think people would have gotten upset that you couldn't do certain things. So, so um, what what I think about that, what what about that is funny though, is the people who got upset are already yeah. the people who shouldn't be using an iPad. This is very true. <laughs> this is absolutely very true. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm kind of dubious about this because I've used the iCloud Drive app before, and I kind of treated that as my Files app. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see whether like what role this plays in comparison to that. Um, I really is anyone's guess, and also who knows if it'll be supported on my, on my <laughs> hardware, which I guess is my uh, my catchphrase this episode. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see um, what a lot of the cloud you know file vendors do. So what does Box yeah. do? What does Dropbox do? Because they they um, you know, for a long time kind of served the role as that virtual files assistant app. Yeah, and now absolutely. Apple is sort of just taking it all over again. Yes, indeed. They've been Sherlocked. We'll have to see, we'll have to see what happens. <laughs> uh, so again. I know what, what happened uh, back in the day, right, is they had extensions yes. uh, that would that would allow somebody to, or some application to basically report, self-report as a thing that could accept files. Yep. And this is definitely what underlies the drag and drop feature too. Um, apps have extensions that can accept certain files and basically Dropbox, Box.net, stuff like that, they would just accept all files. Uh, or accept many types of files, all of the types of files. And the thing about it is that when Apple releases a first-party solution like this, I don't think they're going to have other file providers in the same way. Because like uh, iCloud Drive is a very different animal to this. Mm-hmm. If you, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be, but it, it can be a very different animal. So I don't think Drop uh, Dropbox and Box.net are going to have the same sort of thing. Also, is it Box.net or just Box? I think it's just this Box totally- right now. I I when I used it it was box.net or box.com. Box. I don't know. I feel like it was box.net anyhow, it doesn't matter. It doesn't well, matter. maybe matter. maybe you um dreamed it because you were using your augmented reality app. Okay, I am so psyched about this. Personally, <laughs> this is probably one of my favorite things about iOS 11 other than the fact that it has Safari which has WebRTC. Um <laughs> this the is AR demos. This yeah. is uh AR kit and this is I uh, and I love how they do this at Apple instantly the largest ar platform in the world it has it didn't even come out yet it's in beta mode but it's still the largest ar platform in the world right because nobody had to do anything yeah right? just like uh just like a uh, uh, songs of innocence that youtube album was instantly the the, the most the popular one. song in history forever ah <laughs> uh, yeah the, the uh, most you know. downloaded track of any artist ever <sighs> Yeah, oh. d- don't make don't make me quote you too because you know I'll do it. Oh. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was I almost had one there, but but then you laughed and then I lost it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I've I've been broken. Uh, anyhow, uh, AR Kit's going to be really sweet. Uh, I've taken a look at the API and I'm going to do some more look uh, looking at this tonight. Uh, there, there's a WDC WWDC session going on right now as we record uh, over in beautiful San Jose, California to uh to kind of uh show folks what uh ar kit's going to be like what the interfaces or what what the, what the api is going to be going to be like and uh probably give some folks some tips and tricks on how to how to work with it i am anxiously awaiting that session being posted live because uh i really want to dig in to this stuff asap the neat thing about it is it's very similar to like 3js if you've ever worked with that mm-hmm. it's not similar uh clearly because uh you're working in totally different programming language, totally different environments, totally different targets. But uh, the the same kind of like GL, uh, OpenGL or WebGL style, uh, or, or to backtrack a little bit, the same kind of thing that you'd use if you were working with any sort of framework that helps you work with WebGL or any sort of framework that helps you render things. Um, 
scene kit is very much a uh, an API that that uh, matches with those things. So it's pretty quick. Uh, if you, if you worked with any of the previous uh, any other sort of rendering engine whatsoever, you can kind of move to that. Uh, I use rendering engine in kind of a a sense that rendering engine doesn't mean. But if you worked with something like three JS uh, or even like a frame, uh, oh, yeah. community, you'll yep. probably you'll probably rec- uh, recognize the way that these API uh, the, the functions in those API work. That's really nice. I think, um, you know, as far as, as far as AR goes, we've actually done some work in our office about, um, VR stuff with a frame nice. and it's, it's pretty cool stuff, but it's just so early. It is, it's at least two years early for mm. normal developers, um, to really be able to make something useful in it. For um, sure. you know, you either need to have a company that, has millions of dollars ready to burn in order for people to learn and experiment and then produce with. Right. Or you need to wait two years. And hopefully this helps people maybe not make anything specifically for the Apple platform, but at least help people train themselves to make it available for a broader audience in the future. For sure. I think uh, from some of the performance stuff that I've seen and just the, just the, uh, so, some of the some of the code I've seen so far, it looks it looks pretty exciting uh, to that to that end for sure. So is is this code stuff? Is this being done with Swift? Yes, it cool. is Swift, I believe. That is, you, I think, folks can use Objective C. Don't but, don't do that. Um, don't do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did I ever tell you about the time that I implemented uh, like callbacks in Objective C? Right. Well, that, uh, that sounds a like uh, implementing them in C, which is, in my experience, wonderful and lots of fun. It was exactly as you described. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. man, Locks it it, it so feels great. like it's as fun as passing void pointers around. It kind of it kind of is. It that's that's how it feels. Yeah, it's almost like that's what that's what it is in part. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. well, so let's talk about um, when this ships. This ships in the fall. You know, yes, with that indeed. new iPhone that we're going to get in fall. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we did talk about a lot of stuff about iOS, but there's a bunch of other stuff they didn't talk about during the keynote. But I did put a link in the show notes so that you can go look up, uh, look up other stuff they talked about. There's some actually really cool stuff in iOS 11 that we didn't get a chance to say. Yeah, that um, Verge piece is really solid. I was reading it. Yeah. Uh, at, well, I was reading it slightly before lunch this morning. Uh, yeah. And, uh, so go um, look at that because there's some cool stuff, but we actually have some more cool new hardware to talk about, which is the new iPad. Yes. Woo-hoo! The 10.5 inch iPad pro, which is replacing the smaller 9.7 inch model, uh, which I thought was, was pretty fascinating. I know a couple of folks who had just bought, uh, who just purchased, uh, the 9.7 inch pros. And, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting cause you, like that that seems like a subtle uh a subtle change but i think uh some of the other design decisions they made that we're about to get into uh can give some more context for why 10.5 might have been selected yeah uh, this before this, we get there. this whole thing yeah. is really interesting uh let's sure. go ahead you go no i was just gonna say that um processor wise it uses the a10x fusion yeah uh I, I, I'm betting that the next version of the iPad Pro is going to have the A10X Fusion Elite Extreme uh, Second uh, Special edition. Forces Edition. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, like <laughs> yeah, so um, I believe the iPhone 7 has the A10X, I mean the A10 Fusion. And so yeah. usually they'll put an X in there for more what graphics. Um, yeah. I, I assume the X is for the word graphics. I mean, what else could it be? Probably. Um, and and so this, this iPad has, um, a home button, as you can imagine. Now, I don't know if this home button is like the iPhone's home button. It's just kind of a piece of glass and, or is it actually a button? I don't know. But, but the key point of this particular iPad is the thinner bezel, less bezel all the way around less. There's still some, but less, which is a hint, hint of things to come. You might say. Yeah, some people described it as having no bezel, and I was like, mm, I think that's incorrect based yes. on the screenshots. Yes, seen, according to my um, phone here, no bezel looks quite a bit different. Right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes, yeah. so so 
it, and, and it makes sense to have a bezel on an iPad, especially one that you do drawing with, because this is an sure. iPad Pro, and so it has the pencil, and you would like to have a place to put your fingers or hand to hold the device in place on the table or on your lap, because uh-huh. if you don't have a bezel, there's nowhere really to hold. Now, the display on this particular model is kind of interesting. So it has the same resolution as its bigger counterpart, which is the 12.9 inch, but it has a 120 hertz display. Which is really fast. Absolutely. Super fast. Now, another interesting thing is, as you mentioned, this replaces the previous version of the 9.7-inch model Pro. Now, what's weird about that is, do you recall the price of that device? Yes, it was not $649. That's it right. It was about $200 less, if I recall correctly. Yeah, wasn't it starting at like either $499 or $599? Something like that. Yeah, so the 499 golden price point is gone um, because, as you might know, the regular iPad is also gone. It has now been dumbed down and has a lame screen, and but it's only priced at 329 which is a great price for an iPad. What's weird is the 499 golden price is just gone, and now we have the good iPad starting at this whopping $649. Um, you know, who could have thought back in the day in what 2011 or 2010 that this iPad the iPad that everybody would want cost so much more than back then right absolutely absolutely i mean you're you're so right about 4 499 or there about being being kind of like the the golden price point you know it's not that's too exactly cheap it's I'm not at. too expensive it's just right yeah that's exactly where i bought mine at and to and to have, like really what this does is it forces folks to make the decision between the iPad that is very, very, very decidedly consumer, uh, right? Yes, and, ve- it's and very, that. um, you know, it, it it's um economy class. Oh, well, is that the cheap one? Right, exactly. Uh, like uh, no no frills. Yeah. Uh, no frills, Coach. Right, Coach. Uh, it's the, the Coach Spirit, iPad. The Spirit Airlines of iPads. Yeah, and then, it, uh, it really is. For, for six forty nine, you can you can buy into. Uh, to just regular coach. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe a little bit better than that, but yes. Ah, uh, comfort comfort coach, right? Right, coach comfort or whatever. Right. Oh, okay. So first class is obviously a MacBook Pro, fifteen inch. I get it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so this uh, iPad starts at six forty nine, and it comes at sixty four gigabytes. Now we must we must applaud Apple for doing this and not giving it thirty two or sixteen. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my god. Oh my. Um, and really impressive is for only a thousand dollars, you can get five hundred and twelve gigabytes of storage. Oh my goodness, that is that is nice, but also is it also a thousand dollars? Is it is it a thousand dollars on top of six forty nine, or is it a thousand dollars total? T- th- uh, it's uh, it's, it's actually nine forty nine. So I just rounded up. Um, yeah, and, and okay. so that's that's relatively reasonable, I it, guess. So nine forty nine for the uh 10.5 and then uh 1099 for the 12.9 512 model uh-huh um and of course those prices go up by who knows how much for the wireless versions oh um and and so um we are now going to discuss briefly again about how many ipad models there are so now there are four variants the 12.9 10.5 ipad and ipad mini 4 each of those devices comes in three colors except the 10.5 also comes in rose gold in addition to gold space gray and silver and then um many of these model models the two uh pro models come in three storage sizes plus mere storage sizes of uh, wi-fi plus cellular the two lower end models come in various storage capacities suffice it to say there are so many SKUs of ipad it is simply unbelievable very true. Very true. And it's it's almost uh it, it's 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 a rather large chore to figure out to identify where I to start from nothing, uh to try to find a way to determine which of which of these would even remotely fit me. Particularly when you look at the fact that pretty much everything has at least two storage options. And at a certain point you 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 start comparing the prices across this matrix, uh, and you're like, oh well I could get the if I got the twelve point nine inch iPad Pro I could get 256 gigs for a, a flat 1029, but then if I if I want the iPad uh, the 10.5 inch, I could pay just fifty dollars more 
and get the 512 gig Wi-Fi and cellular, and I'd only sacrifice a little bit of screen. And then, but as you but go, then but then you're torn yeah. if you want cellular and uh, man, it's yeah. Just a disaster. Do you want cellular and more screen space? Do you want Wi-Fi or cellular? Do you, yeah? Do you want? And then yeah. and then here here's the weirdest thing though, the iPad Mini Four didn't get any updates um, at this event, but for uh, some reason the only storage option for the iPad Mini is 128 gigabytes. Which is just unbelievable. At at three ninety nine, so the smallest iPad you can buy costs more than the regular iPad at three twenty nine at thirty two gigabytes. None of this yeah. makes any sense. The pricing model for these iPads are just out the window. It feels arbitrary, almost. It feels absolutely arbitrary. Well, it, it, you know, back in the old days, you know, people would always talk about the Apple lineup as being this kind of pricing umbrella, like there was a price for everybody. Yeah. And here we are. Arriving at the conclusion, the climax of the pricing umbrella. Um, this is the pricing umbrella. We have a price range from twelve twenty nine to three twenty nine. It's amazing, but man, is it confusing. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, yeah. I think there's just one more thing. One more thing. Uh, one more thing we have to discuss. Okay, and that is the Home Pod. The Home Pod. Now, I have to ask you a serious question. Yep. When you were told the name of this object, did you take it seriously or did you laugh at it? Uh, I might have chuckled a bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Just checking because I did too. Yeah. I. Uh, it's. It's tricky. So this is Apple's uh, entry into the market of what can only be described as a thing that sits in your house and listens to you when you tell it things. Um, I like uh-huh. the um the ETP reference, "Lady in a Can." <laughs> Yeah, that's that's fair too. Uh, I think I think the trick, so the trick with all of these devices, and I've 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 uh, used the SDKs of some of these devices. I've owned some some of these devices, namely the Echo Dot. Um, the the thing of it is, like I think for anyone who really adores their Echo Dot, the HomePod doesn't really offer them very much whatsoever. In fact, I was talking with somebody who adores their Alexa devices, and they'd said that. Um, that the HomePod just really feels uh, like like a lame way to access Siri, or it, uh, uh, a, 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 a not very good ac- way to access Siri. And Siri is not even very helpful for the things that they want such an appliance to do. Right, uh, which so I it's... thought was a little weird because for me, the HomePod feels a lot more in, in tune with what I want out of out of one of these things, which is accessing content. Right, and so that's such an interesting thing. So. There's sort of these two camps of people. So there's the person who wants the assistant, first and foremost. And then there's the person who wants an intelligent speaker, basically. Yep. And and so um, a lot of people in my office had really conflicted feelings about this. So, okay, it's a great price. It's three forty nine, dollars which is an excellent price for a speaker of this quality. So it has uh, a bass woofer. It has seven tweeters, and it has basically beamforming for sound. It can intelligently bounce sound off your walls and other right. objects in your room, and it can even figure out where you personally are by um, bouncing sound off of your fleshy tissue and specifically target you. Super cool. It can even even cooperate with additional units in the same room or multiple rooms to increase the sound by using HomeKit and other cool tricks. Right. What an amazing package. For sure. But... Then you also have, it's a speaker, and it also runs Siri stuff, and so now you can talk to it. Um, it has six microphones. I'm sure it can hear you quite far away, and you don't have to scream at it. And I, I think it's it's a, you know, great price for a great pack, package, great product, but it fulfills two different needs sort of simultaneously, but in a really undirected, loose way. So you've got the people who just want to talk to the assistant, but you have to buy a speaker. That you didn't really need, but then the people who wanted kind of just a smart speaker, well, do I really need Siri in it? So there's it's right. these two different camps. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think I think the trick is for a lot of the folks who were looking for like uh, some sort of like light years jump in Siri's capability to be more Denied. like Alexa or Google Home did not get that, and. Admittedly, personally, I'm kind of cool. I'm kind of all right with that, and I'm actually kind of interested in a HomePod. I don't think I'll buy one, but I'm interested in that in that as a technology. Yeah. Um, having worked with uh, Alexa and Echo Echo mm-hmm. Dot, I feel like it's very much of a, a consumption oriented machine in the sense of 
uh, a way for you to buy things on Amazon. And that's kind of, maybe that's a reductive, uh, a reductive perspective. But really, even even the tools that folks are given to build applications with Alexa are uh, very much transaction oriented, right? So like even if even if you're doing something that creates news or, or that or that gives delivers podcasts or news or music or something, it's like person asks for thing, application gives person thing. There's not shared context between other utterances that right. folks might have, and until you until you find a way to build that context. Um, Alexa is always going to be just like really good at this particular class of thing. Yeah, I think um, you know if you if if you kind of look at the home kit angle of this too, it also serves yeah. a need for people who really want to get into the home automation um, and maybe want a little bit more than just having to hit the button on the phone. You know, yeah. Siri on the phone, you can say, "Hey Siri, I hope everybody's device is activated." Um, <laughs> Um, Mine did not, but I realize that's because I'm wearing headphones. Right, now. right. I'm I'm glad you look though to make sure. <laughs> um, now everybody else is looking around their room just to make sure too. Yes. Um, you know, I I think a lot of people will will use this to not have to just talk to their phone. It's for really sure. convenient for me to walk into my kitchen and just say, "Okay, Google," and of course, it doesn't do it because I it never works when I try. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's really convenient just to be able to say. Um, what, what do you have to say to make Alexa go? Uh, Alexa, ask NPR news to tell me a joke. Okay. So when you say those things, it's really convenient just to be able to walk into a room and just do it. It's wonderful. Um, although I've never said, Hey Cortana, go do this thing because I, I, I'm never going to talk to Cortana. That's a lost cause. Um, yeah, (laughs) But but I had to tar- I had to throw that one in there because I needed to target all four to make sure everybody right. suffered. Exactly, um, exactly. It's it's just it's another way to talk to the thing that you want to talk to, and it's really convenient to have a thing that's always plugged in, always has a connection, always has a charge, and you know for sure is always listening. Because my phone sitting right <laughs> next to me, even though I have the Google Assistant turned on on this thing, it never listens. Mm, interesting. So for me, I've had some difficulty with my phone listening to me, but usually that's because it's turned over, which I believe it indicates is a don't listen when oh. turned over. Uh, that That's kind of a thing it, it accepts. So my, my watch is usually better about it, but if my phone is turned so that the, the screen is upside down, I think the proximity sensor thinks that it, that you are, it's either in your pocket or in some sort of a situation where you're not actually talking to it, which I think is a really interesting interesting thing for it to do. Um, so, for example, um, I guess I've got to get equal opportunity now and say, hey, Siri, tell me what time it is. Sure enough, it worked. That's good. Now it now works. flip it back over and see if it does it. Uh, so the trick is it's going to it's going to detect that I have my watch and oh. it's going to it's going to tell it's going to do it on my watch instead. Fine. So, uh, hey, Siri, tell me what time it is. Nope. Did not work on either. <laughs> yeah. Time. So I took off my watch in the in the time it took for. Uh, for me to describe that there but um if if my phone is the only thing in reach for example if my watch is charging um it's it can be really great to to have that and i think my 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 phone does a good job of it um but really that's those are kind of the interactions that i use most heavily uh with with siri for some situation where my 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 phone and my watch is is listening and it's something very um kind of low stakes like that or to, or to walk me through an interface, right? Yeah. So uh, to to play or pause music or to find a certain type of music, um, I think Overcast, you can launch Overcast with it too. And like this kind of app launcher mm-hmm. view of Siri is another thing that I kind of like, admittedly. Um, yeah, you know, I never launch apps with my Google Assistant because I just click on them. It's easier. That's fair. That's fair. Um, I don't know where any of my apps are ever. Oh, right. Because uh, on iOS, you can't arrange them like the way, you know, you want them. <sighs> Man. Uh, yeah. Mm. That's the one thing they could have added, but they didn't add. No, um, I, I search for every app all the time. Yeah. <laughs> that's how it works for me. They they uh, they patented that, so we can't do that anymore on, uh, on Android. This is true. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's really interesting. Really, really interesting device. You know, kind of, kind of funny. Um, this is three forty nine, and I think the Nexus Q, which was Google's, like, accidentally we made this thing that nobody wanted, um, right. product from many, many, like four years ago, 
Um, I think it was two ninety nine, and it had all this stuff in it. It didn't have a speaker, but it had the the amp and the high quality DAC, and um, you plug it into your own speakers. And that was a dead on arrival product. And here we are, four years later, I think, and um, you know everybody's raving about this fuzzy speaker thing. Huh, what a weird, what a weird thing. Right, right. And it's, uh, so like, I, I guess another thing that's, that's interesting about it is right now we don't know to what degree there will be third party ability to develop for this thing. Mm. Uh, Alexa and Google Home both have uh, ecosystems for which uh, folks can, can build applications. Right. And that, they had, uh, they've already had use. multiple years of people doing it. Right. And I, I think generally speaking, what we've seen from those are some pretty low quality stuff. <laughs> um, yes. So, so it's so what what will happen inevitably is next year when the um Siri kit for HomePod API exists um will God that is just a ridiculous phrase Siri kit for HomePod uh, but you <laughs> That's know just like so much gibberish you, <laughs> I I just hate the name HomePod to be honest yeah I feel um they um so Marco on the ATP show um said they should just rename everything here to Siri and, and it just made so much sense I agree with him. This right. this thing could have just been called Siri, and people would have said, "Okay, fine, Siri the speaker or whatever, S- Siri speaker." Um, I I, I think it's uh it's a uh, it's cool, but uh, I don't need it. Yeah. Yep. I am with you. Now, um, we do have a uh, predetermined time follow up. Uh, yes, indeed, it is. It is pre follow up. The 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 follow up has has already happened. Us up. Yes. yes. Um, Brian says that he will buy one because he wants to put it in his basement. He's been looking for, you know, a speaker slash smart assistant kind of thing for his basement. And uh, the HomePod fits his bill perfectly. But the That's problem awesome. but with fitting his bill is that it will only start selling in December. And Ooh. with Apple's notorious supply shortage... Who knows if any will actually be in stock by, you know, the holidays. And so Brian will have one in his basement by February. Right. And then like the, then then the question becomes what, what will his basement be next year? Ooh. And then (laughs) the question will be, will they launch another one at WWDC next year? (gasps) Oh no. (laughs) No, I, I, I doubt Apple will, will, uh, will iterate on this product that fast. No, I I agree. Um, It's, it's going to be, um, you know, it's kind of like the Apple Watch where they announced it like nine months ahead of time. Right. Yeah. No big deal. Right. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, nonetheless, that is a solid showing uh, from from the WWDC keynote this year. That's probably one of the largest uh, new product drops we've seen in a long time. Yeah. Um, um, I think I think this keynote was really good overall. Um, you know, you know, for not being a hardware event, sure was a lot of hardware. Right. Right. And I think the technology that underlies a lot of this hardware or the narrative that, that uh, came along with it was really, was really strong. Yep. Uh, so this, this also was one of the WWDC keynotes that felt the most developer oriented, despite also releasing hardware, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. So uh, it'll be kind of cool to see what happens over the next couple of days as the technical sessions go through. Uh, I've got a couple that I've got my eye on already. Um, to just to kind of see what what comes out of this from a technical perspective, that we might get some more hints at future products and future directions that Apple's going that maybe uh, wasn't wasn't part of that uh, main presentation on Monday. Yeah, I would. Um, so if if you if you if you're looking through those sessions and you see anything on um, you know any of their work on privacy or uh, you know technology related to privacy let me know because that's one of those things that i'm really interested in and um google has zero sessions on privacy <sighs> ah google ah uh, google so it we, turns out when i search google privacy i got zero search results back right you can see why <laughs> i uh you can see why i uh don't necessarily want a google home in my you know that <laughs> in my that, vicinity. you know i love that thing Sort of, yeah. But it keeps activating when I don't do anything, like sitting there, and I say I say a word, and it's like bling, I'm listening, and it's like stop it. Yeah, <laughs> did not want this. Yeah, I gotcha. Yep, I gotcha. Okay, well, um, thanks for uh, doing uh, WWDC coverage with me. This is always fun to do. Um, as Absolutely you is. as you might know, this is a Nixa special uh, for WWDC 2017. Um, where can we find you on the internet, Brandon? 
You can find me uh, at a lot of places, but probably most frequently on Twitter, where my username is Brandon underscore MN. Replace that underscore with a dot, and you've got my website, Brandon dot MN. Uh, and, and if you want another thing that has MN in it, sometimes uh, once a month or so, I will uh, run this meetup called JavaScript MN, JavaScriptMN.com, uh, where you can see me ramble. Uh, for a couple minutes and then see some really cool talks about what's going on in the world of uh, the web's favorite programming language to love and hate at the same time uh, with some really cool folks. How about you, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter and Ryan Amar. And of course, on my website, which is ryanrampersad.com, where I now have being automatically deployed from GitLab and GitLab CI. That's awesome. It is pretty cool. Yep. Well, uh, thanks again for coming, and I hope you have a good one. You as well. See you next time.